the early church responded to hardship and difficulty. And we discovered that they asked three questions. Those three questions were, who is going to be at special risk? How can we help? And who can we send? Well, in this lesson, we want to look at the writings of the one person who not only expanded the boundaries of the church, but whose understanding in, of faith in Jesus influences us to this very day. Of course, I'm talking about the writings of the Apostle Paul. No other person has so significantly impacted what Christians believe. And, and the section of his writings that we're going to be examining is Romans chapter 8. Boy, that is such a great chapter in Scripture. Romans 8 is a section of Scripture full of faith and hope and love. It begins with the great declaration. You see it on your screen. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's the way it begins, and then it, it ends with one of the grandest statements of assurances recorded in the entire New Testament. We, we, you're, you're familiar with it. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we take those two statements together, the two statements that bookend this chapter, Romans chapter 8, we discover that Christianity at its heart is an expression of triumph and assurance. And therefore, it is to Romans chapter 8 that we will turn as we seek confidence and victory in these uncertain times. One of the, one of the main themes of Romans chapter 8, in fact, the primary theme of Romans chapter 8, is the presence of God's Holy Spirit, the one who leads and guides and walks along the followers of Jesus in all circumstances. Yet there's another theme also that's contained in this chapter, and that theme is the inevitability of suffering in the life of the believer. Those two themes, both of them together, come together in the middle of this chapter in a great statement of assurance, and this is what we read. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is confirmation and evidence that we are true children of God. What a promise that if you recall uh, in David's sermon that some of us were able to listen to earlier this morning, he touched on that briefly. That reality, the fact that the Spirit confirms that we are children, God's children, it reminds us that the essence of faith in Jesus is not rules, but relationships. And the Holy Spirit within us testifies to the depth of that relationship. We are God's children. And all followers of Jesus have received God's Spirit. And as God's children, we are being led into an inheritance, continually toward an inheritance that awaits us. And yet Paul offers an interesting condition behind this inheritance. Isn't it interesting what he says? He said, it, it is in suffering that we demonstrate that we are the true heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus. Suffering, it seems, is the inevitable path that the followers of Jesus must walk. And yet Paul quickly adds that this suffering is small compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. We need to spend a little time talking about glory, brothers and sisters. We assume that whenever Bob, Paul 
talks about glory, he's referring to the final stage of the Christian. That is, our future glory in heaven will make our present sufferings as if they were nothing, seem as if they were nothing. And, and I agree with that. I agree with that understanding, and that's part of what Paul is talking about here. But we need to remember that the glory shared by God's people is much broader than simply going to heaven when we die. It's more than that. We need to remember that how glory is defined in the life of Jesus. He is glorified not just in the ascension when he proceeds to reign with the Father. Jesus is also glorified when he suffers and dies. As his death approaches, he affirms the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. As he considers the crucifixion, he says, now the Son is glorified, and God is glorified with him. The Son is glorified when he accomplishes the will of the Father, and God is glorified when the Son submits to suffer for God's people so they can be redeemed. The New Testament itself, though, asserts that God's people are glorified when through the power of the Spirit, they become more like Jesus. And we, look, this is a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. As the Spirit changes us and transforms us into the image of Jesus, the glory we share is ever-increasing. When, when we continue the work of Jesus and, and live like Jesus, we reflect the glory that God intends. Both understandings of glory, that which is experienced in the present and that which culminates in the future, both of those ideas are present here in Romans chapter 8. And as Paul reminds his readers and us of the certain glory of God's people, he will contrast that with the circumstances of the present. And this is what he writes. For the creation waits with eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. According to Paul here, all creation is waiting in earnest longing for the day when the children of God will complete their work. Jesus himself began the work of freeing creation from decay, of liberating it from bondage, and, and perhaps the transformed body he displayed at his resurrection provides us a glimpse of what that liberation will be like. Because God's people by his spirit have been transformed into the image of his son, they continue the ministry that Jesus started. We become more like Jesus. This means that our purpose in life is not simply to go to heaven when we die. We have another purpose. It is to continue Jesus' ministry of renewal, to dedicate ourselves to make this world the way God intended it to be, to ensure that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. God has always accomplished his will through human beings, even to the extent of becoming one himself. Doing what God wants and accomplishing his purposes is what it means to be made in God's image. His will was gloriously fulfilled in the human being, Jesus. Those who reflect the image of Jesus, those who are indwelt by God's Spirit, will continue the restorative work of renewal, helping the world become what God intends it to be. And so his people bring glory to themselves, they bring glory to the Father and the Son when we do that work 
when we serve, when we help, when we strengthen, when we teach. And so Paul continues, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Just, just as humanity in the present falls short of the glory of God, so creation as a whole has been, reflect, has been affected by sin and also waits and longs for redemption. Both creation and the community of the redeemed long for everything to be made right. We do. We do. We don't like the way it is now. And, and notice, notice what Paul writes here about the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Spirit in God's people is the first expression of the hope that is certain. A hope that is so real, so sure, that we wait with a patient confidence, assured of this coming reality. In the meantime, though, we groan. And creation groans along with us. Though we may not know, we may, we may not have noticed much groaning in creation before now, but it's certainly real in the present. Our world is groaning. It is in travail. It is in pain. And we are here in the midst of it. For many of us, there hasn't been a moment like this in our own lifetimes. This coronavirus is taking its toll. Not only in the 150,000 deaths in our own country, but in the stress and distress of, of millions because of this social distancing. So many are without company and without help and, and are, are in loneliness. Others are losing jobs and livelihoods and with no anticipation of when things are going to get better. For others, the sheer continuance of the situation without resolution produces circumstances that are difficult to tolerate. How long is this going to go on? It doesn't seem that we can take this much more. In the six weeks we've had this Bible study, we've been trying to determine how Christians should respond to this coronavirus. And there are voices out there telling us what we should be saying. Some are, some are, are saying, we, we ought to be saying, well, this is happening because you're all sinners. Or, or uh, we ought to be saying, you know, you all need to be prepared for the end because Jesus is, this is proving that Jesus is coming soon. Uh, or at the very least, we know what's going on and you ought to be listening to us. And yet according to Paul, instead of commenting from the sidelines, the followers of Jesus are caught up in the same groaning that the world experiences. Because of who we follow, we are painfully aware of the big gap, the gap that exists between where we are right now and the people we shall eventually be. Right now we are meek, we are weak and frail and muddled and, confu and confused, and, and yet we see what we, we will be someday. We will, we will be risen from the dead into a glorious immortality. We're still waiting for that to happen. We're still waiting in this uncertain present for what we will become someday. And so in the meantime, we groan with the rest of creation. And then Paul tells us what we should be doing in the meantime. He tells us to pray. Let's read. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us in wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. 
because of our weaknesses as human beings, we experience fundamental limitations in prayer. We, 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 well, there are times we don't even know what to pray for. Yet it is precisely when we feel that way. It is precisely when we feel ill-equipped and weak that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with wordless groans. Wow. The Holy Spirit identifies with our groans, with the pain of our world and our longing for redemption. And he not only shares our yearnings, but conveys our pain in ways that words cannot express. Paul's message is clear. Look what he says. At the present time, above all else, the church should be praying. But this is a strange prayer indeed. Here we are at the heart of one of the most glorious passages in all of Scripture, and Paul is saying, we don't know what to pray for. But that's okay. Paul evidently knows what it's like to be in distress in the present. He knows what it's like to be at a complete loss when it comes to prayer. And so by writing about it so clearly here, the implication is that this is normal and nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's the natural place for God's people to be who are caught in the gap between the way things are and the way God wants them to be, between the way things are and, and, what, and, 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 and the way things will be when they become what God wants. We acknowledge that we are pleasantly living, that we are presently living in the middle of perpetual uncertainty. It is no wonder that we don't know how to pray. And yet this not knowing, this not being in control is in itself the right place to be. For it compels us to simply groan and depend on God and his spirit. At the very moment in which we discover that we ourselves are groaning, do not know what to do or say, at that same moment, we find that God himself, the God, the Holy Spirit, is groaning. Groaning without words. We expect God to be, as we might say, in charge, taking control, setting things right, getting things done. But the God we see in Jesus is the God who weeps at the tomb of his friend, God who did the job of a sleigh who watched his disciples feet. The God we see in Jesus is God the Spirit who groans without words. Not only do we the followers of Jesus sometimes not have any words to say, any great pronouncements to make about what all this means. But we, the followers of Jesus, find ourselves up, caught, caught up as well in the groaning of creation. And we discover that at the same time, God is groaning with us. This then is our vocation in the present circumstances, to be in prayer for the world in its pain. I think we have a, a line to go across. This is our vocation in present circumstances. There we, uh, yeah, to be, there we are, great, thank you. To be in prayer in the world with its pain. Uh, I'm, I th I'm surprised. I know what I'm going to say. Travis does not know what I'm going to say. So I appreciate him. At those very moments when we find ourselves weeping with grief at the death of a friend, when we find ourselves groaning at the impossibility of having a proper funeral, when we find ourselves in distress at the horrors of millions of poor in this world being at risk, or simply when we're sad because things are locked down and that is inherently depressing. In all of those moments, when any words we try to say don't come out right, and sometimes they only come out as tears and, and, and sobs, it is then that we have to remind ourselves 
that this is how God the Spirit is present at the heart of his creation. That's where he is. God the creator, facing his world, seeing a creation in distress and despair, is the God who groans. And so we see our task and our calling. The Apostle Paul describes a three-stage movement. Can you see it here? Followers of Jesus are called to be people of prayer and it's pain. And we begin, Paul begins by talking about the groaning of the world. First, there's the groaning of the world. And second, there's the groaning of the church. And third, there's the groaning of the spirit within the church and within the world. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book, Disappointment with God. It's a great book. It, it's, a, it's an old book. It probably came out about, about 20 years ago, maybe even 25 years ago. And, and in that book, the author, Philip Yancey, articulates three questions that Christians often wonder about, but seldom ask aloud. And, and I, in my opinion, those are three questions that many of us are asking in this present crisis. First question, does God care? Does it even matter to him that his world is overcome with distress and woe? Second question, is, is God hidden? Is he so removed from the realities of human life that, that any kind of divine response can never be known? He's just that distant from us. Why is God silent? Why does he seem to be so aloof? Why does he not speak and offer explanations and guidance in these profoundly uncertain times? Well, brothers and sisters, I think that our readings from Romans chapter 8 provide an answer to each of those pressing questions. For example, does God care? Well, the Holy Spirit groans. His God's hidden. He works through his people. He's moved by their prayers. Is God silent? Well, the truth of the matter of this, he will only appear silent if his people fail to act and speak and pray.